Okay. Right. Okay, I'll use them both. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Lemba Topic. It's a real pleasure to uh, to be with you again. Uh, some of you have seen me in Skegness. Uh, others have just seen me around. Uh, and uh, I've actually left another land to come here, a land which is optimistic, a place where you can really build your own future. Legoland. <laughs> I've come here from Legoland. I left my kids. And I said, I'm just going off for a while. I'll see you later. A little bit like Captain Oates, but hopefully I will get back. Uh, so that's the sacrifice I made. It means I didn't have to pay for lunch. Uh, I'm here to talk about the terrible state we're in. Next uh, slide, please. The Book of Ecclesiastes. I recommend it to those who believe in, it, believe in nothing and those who believe in something, because I think it summarizes the state we're in. And I saw that all toil and all achievement spring from one person's envy of another. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. And in a sense, that's how I feel about British politics. And probably so does Matt Hancock at the moment. <laughs> I'll come back to that. Good politics, I would suggest, involves four things. Engagement with the public, leadership, policy-making community, one where you don't just get it handed to you, but you actually work it with the community for real. Influence internationally, nationally, and regionally, which I think is something you earn rather than you get by some sense of entitlement. And you have to define and win conversations rationally. And we're going to go on to that. Here's an example of bad politics. The climate emergency. I'm glad most of you all are sitting down because I'm going to tell you something. There is no climate emergency. We know. We know. Give yourselves a round of applause. It's, um, he's down, Tiger. Go back one. Go back one. Uh, you already know this because I know this is a crazy thing, but when I went to school, we were taught to deal in facts. We don't de deal in facts much anymore. Uh, I went through that at length in, in Skegness, and this is a slightly different presentation. But the one I'm using this as an example for is a case study in what's going wrong in our society and in our politics. We are assuming that by virtue signaling our way to some woke new world where we stop an emergency which isn't happening, we make the world better. But in fact, we're just handing the keys of the world economy to those countries smart enough to realize that they can sell rubbish to the West while inheriting the gold in China, Russia, and India mainly. Let's go to the next one now. That's a very angry person, ladies and gentlemen. Little Greta Thunberg, who dropped out of school to educate us. There's an irony in that, I think. She's actually a victim of the Green Movement because she was untouchable on account of her extreme autism and everything else. She said, how dare you? I would say, how dare the Green Movement expect us to follow somebody who doesn't understand the basics of climatology, for if she did, she would not be spouting the things that she's been told to speak on behalf of other people and to, and to say. Let's go to the next one. That is an evil cow, ladies and gentlemen. You, you can, it's deliberately farting its way to a climate emergency. And, and if you think about it like that, there are preposterous accusations which are made by the Green Movement to force us to behave and to live in a way of their choosing, not of ours. You begin to understand the problems there. I'm happy to talk more about the details of this later, but I, I, I did that a lot in Skegness, and I'll, I'll keep it brief on this one because it's a case study of what's wrong in politics. Next one, please. The net zero department will save us all, ladies and gentlemen. That is Grant Schatz. He is the head of the uh, Energy Security and Net Zero Ministry, essentially. He flies a private plane. <laughs> He's, by the way, he's a friend of mine, and I hope that he won't mind me too much making these points. And I support his right to fly, fly a private plane. What I'm not so keen on is the idea that the man in charge of net zero can fly around for fun at 16 gallons per hour. That's what his very nice aircraft uh, uses, the Piper Saratoga. Um, and without any sense of irony. 
And yet, this government wants to ban the use of, for example, a 50cc Honda, which will do 110 miles per gallon, and which is used by people who cannot even afford the cost of public transport, let alone a private plane. Now, I, as I say, I like Grant. He's a pretty decent sort of chap. My concern isn't his right to fly a plane. My concern is the government's preposterous insistence that we do things like give up our right to buy petrol and diesel vehicles in order to save ourselves from the great demon CO2. Next slide, please. Failure has happened before. That was Nick Clegg uh, with David Cameron, just in case Nick Clegg's the one on the left, <laughs> who is clearly being operated by David Cameron, as you can see. <laughs> what Nick is about to say is, got all the gear, got all the gear. Uh, Nick did not have a shining record of achievement as leader of the party that I used to be an MP for. Uh, he just seemed to not have a political compass. Why did Nick Clegg cross the road? Because he promised not to. Uh, but now he's doing great work for Facebook. If he does for Facebook what he did for the Liberal Democrats, we won't have to worry about social media in the near future. Next one. Um, I, as the great predictor, wrote a book called The Alternative View, which, which predicted the decline and ultimately the fall of the Liberal Democrats. And in our, in our right on society, the Liberal Democrats did the one thing that they will always do if somebody calls out the trouble. They ostracized me. They actually threw me out of the party. Uh, and I pointed out that if I was causing reputational damage, then they really needed to throw out Nick Clegg, the former leader, and Ed Davey, the current leader, because they both voted against party policy and brought the party into disrepute with millions of students all over the country. Uh, they kind of reinstated me, but I'm not active in the Liberal Democrats anymore. Next one. There's a very unlucky man <laughs> standing next to his misfortune. Yeah. <laughs> Matt Hancock, another friend of mine. You can see the pattern here. <laughs> All the people who fail have something in common. Yeah. Friendship with me. <laughs> Neil's a good friend of mine, too. <laughs> But to lose. Uh, he's got nothing to lose, he says. <laughs> That's a perhaps, yeah. Um, there used to be a group uh, in, in Newcastle called Solo Survivors of Lembitopic. Uh, you get free membership of that if you know me. That's Nick and uh, uh, the, uh, the great Oakshot there, uh, Isabel Oakshot, at the book launch. I think I went to that book launch, in fact. And of course, she has turned on him in the public interest. Though we don't know how much the public interest paid her. Um, uh, Matt's, once again, he's not a bad person, but he is indicative of somebody who is, has, probably has been taken for a ride by his, not just his own party, but the civil servants. Uh, I would say that uh, Matt personifies the problem we now have. He gave 100,000 WhatsApp messages to a journalist. Now, there's a clue in the title of what she does. <laughs> And as a result, there's been huge collateral damage, actually to Isabel Oakshot as well, I think, because he's unlikely to be the confidant for many politicians in future. Damage to Matt and damage to the body politic. Once again, maybe I'm just being radical here, but I think the chances of the government ever being able to enforce another lockdown are rather small <laughs> based on what we have learned, the guesswork the double talking, the heavy handedness, everything you just heard by that excellent, in that excellent presentation about the police. Let's move on. Now let's look at this continuing case study, the facts. Uh, this man-made CO2 crisis is a little bit of a tall order. You've heard that in the United Kingdom, we produce a little bit of CO2, but the whole of the human race produces a little bit of CO2, about 40,000 million tons a year, 40 billion tons a year. That's about 3.5% of all the CO2 that's happening. The other 96.5% comes from nature, about 770 billion metric tons a year. So to give you an idea, 0.04% of the, of the uh, atmosphere is CO2. That's 400 atoms in every million in this room. And of that, we add about 3.5% to the growth. 
That's one atom in 10 million atoms in the atmosphere. I don't think the climate notices that sort of change. And when it does, plants gobble it up because it's actually a fertilizer. And yet, our entire way of life is under threat on the false green fraud that this is actually making a difference to our lives. That, again, a second example of what's gone wrong in our society. I didn't find this in some secret corner, in some, some alcove of, of, of education or research. All of this is freely available. It's hiding in plain sight, but the governments of the Western world in particular choose to use these as control mechanisms of the way that we live life. Next slide, please. There have been some significant developments. For some years, I've been predicting the, the decline and fall of the green religion, really, and that's beginning to happen. Uh, the Biden administration has abandoned the most extremist uh, predictions. It's called RCP 8.5. And that if America eases off on it, and if China's not doing it, and Russia's not doing it, and India's not doing it, probably it's not going to happen very much. And yet, in the UK, in Wales, all major road building projects have been scrapped, partly, largely because they want to be green. What they are going to achieve is the kind of gridlock, which means you don't invest in Wales. What you do is you take your business somewhere where you can get to and from. Has anyone driven along the M4 recently to Swansea? It's 50 miles per hour a lot of the way. Absolutely hopeless. And as a result, what they're doing is, because of this wokeology, beginning to make this country very difficult to actually attract business into. Next uh, the representation there. Now, the late Frank Dobson was a friend of mine, and he summed something up. He's dead. He's dead. It's even worse for him. <laughs> but before he went, thanks very much indeed, Neil. Yeah. Um, before he went, he tell, did tell me something. That if you press it once, he said to me once, 20% of everything we do in Parliament is virtually pointless. 20% of everything we do in Parliament is virtually pointless. And again, but the other 80% is pointless. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think I would say 70-30, but a lot of what happens in politics is utter tosh. It's nonsense. They know it. You know it. But they say it because that's what they think they have to do, because they're followers rather than leaders. Let's move on. Uh, I'm, I, was, I was quite pleased to meet him, uh, Brenta, Mr. Brenta. He's the president of the World Economic Forum. And I had a chat with him. It was on Chatham House Rules, and I'm not going to betray that. Uh, so I'll tell it as Isabel, and then she can tell you what he said. <laughs> but um, essentially, it, I had the impression he knows. He knows that this is nonsense. I asked him a question. I can share it because I said it, even if I can't share the answer. I said to him, can any economy which makes CO2 reduction its number one priority ever outperform an economy that does not? Now, it's a tricky answer. It's a simple question, tricky answer, because we all know it's impossible. And all we've really done with our woke nonsense is export our manufacturing and our CO2 production. There's no point in slamming China for making loads of CO2 when they're making it for us. And this is the problem that we've got. The conversation with him actually was quite interesting, and I might be doing some work on water purification, which is a totally noble thing that the WLEF can uh, be involved in. But let's not pretend that the people at the top are under the illusion, in my, this is my opinion, are under the illusion that much of this adds up. Next. Uh, I, I put this in by request. Uh, I'm not going to go into it in great detail, but I'm working on a, on a theory of wokeism, why, how it operates. Uh, some of you may have heard the, of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, it starts with physiological needs, then safety, love and belonging, esteem and self-actualization. My theory, I'm cutting this down to 30 seconds, next slide please, is that the way this works is the leaders want self-esteem and they use love and belonging and safety needs, the application of fear, to get that self-esteem and to get control. The reason I say the leaders aren't trying to do this through self-actualization, which is the top one, the best one, if you like, is because if they were really into truth, then they wouldn't mess around with lies. And they wouldn't ignore 
the incontrovertible scientific facts, and the science is settled on this in my view, that CO2 caused by humans cannot make a significant, or cannot make a measurable difference or not a large difference to the climate. So that's where things I think are going wrong. Next slide, please. Now, this leads to very practical outcomes. Sadiq Khan's ULES zone expansions from August means that if you can afford a posh Tesla, you can drive around for free. If you get a, a Euro 6 Maserati with a 5-litre engine, no problem. But if you're driving a 20-year-old Ford Cortina, because that's all you can, or Sierra, that's all you can afford, then you're going to be slammed every day with the tax. So what this means is it takes away the mobility from the people least able to afford to lose it. Yeah. And this is all predicated on the climate emergency and with you, Les, although they get mixed up with this, the health emergency caused by the emissions from our vehicles. Uh, it's interesting, I did some research into particulate matter, which is the gr another great demon. It does affect people who are hypersensitive and people with bad asthma and so on. So there are people who really are affected by this, but most of us are not. And the place with the highest life expectancy in the UK is also the place with the highest particulate matter, which is Marleybun. And that's because of wealth. Because the wealth factor massively outdoes anything that particulates do. Uh, can we just do questions at the end rather than just now? I'll just, I've nearly finished anyway. Um, uh, I'm happy to, to answer if, if there's a time. So, so I, when you look at the facts again, this is the real consequence of these idiotic policies. Next one. 15-minute cities, local agenda 21, which I dismissed as utter rubbish in the early 90s, is now how we're supposed to live. Never mind the fact that if you shut down the center of a city from vehicles, you therefore exclude the elderly, the infirm, and the disabled, uh, and you just mean uh, and make it easier for able-bodied people who can cycle and walk to go around. It's actually another form of control. Next, please. So this is what we can do about it. There's something called Operation Earthquake, uh, and the goal is to make internal combustion engine ban electorally Im more important than party politics. Uh, I work with the Motorcycle Action Group and with other groups as well, uh, the Alliance of British Drivers. Uh, Ules Phil, where is he? Ules Phil's here. He, I work with him as well. Uh, actually, nobody knows your surname. <laughs> I suppose it's just Phil, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. No, no, it's all right. We, we all know he's Ules Phil. And the momentum's growing because what we're doing is we're educating the public. There's been trouble in Oxford as people begin to feel subject to the first climate lockdown there. And millions are still unaware of the implications. So the first thing, tell people what's going to happen. They don't have to understand the minutiae of climatology. They don't have to understand the details. They just have to understand they can't use their car anymore without paying for it through the nose. Uh, while millionaires with expensive cars can do what they like. And incidentally, that also belies the fact that they're not serious. Policymakers aren't serious either. What it means is if everyone was rich enough, you could carry on polluting just as much as you do now. Because you just have to pay to pollute. Uh, and if there really was a climate emergency, if they really thought we were all going to end up in that graveyard because of the climate, then you shouldn't be able to buy your way to the right to, to pollute. Next. Now, there are immediate next steps. I'm suggesting we call out the eco-fraud. We make formal complaints to educational authorities who do other woke things as well. Uh, we vote out virtue signaling pretenders who cannot justify what they're doing to us. We demand facts and reject emotional diatribes, and we never surrender to woke rubbish. Never surrender. I was born in Northern Ireland, actually. Um, <laughs> I remember that, actually, uh, the never surrender thing. There was a, a piece of graffiti by the Orange Order. Belfast says no. All over the, there's a wall in Ormo Road. Belfast says no. And, and somebody actually did this big piece of graffiti. said, the man from Del Monte says yes. <laughs> <laughs> and there's more. Oh, Del Monte says yes, and he's the biggest orange man of all. <laughs> um, but taking it from the unionists, we should never surrender to woke rubbish because it's not even good for the people they're pretending to help. Last one. There's a film called Bullworth, one of my favorite films. I recommend you all watch it. Uh, it was a bit of an independent production by Warren Beatty, and it didn't get much distribution because it really unsettled the establishment. The idea was this congressman was washed up and depressed. He pays for somebody to kill him over a weekend because he's had enough of life and he wants his kids to get the life insurance. Halle Berry had a big break in it as well. Uh, so he's basically this washed up, uh, slightly naive, very dejected kind of wreck of a man who's 
um, close to being seduced by a gorgeous young woman. I relate a lot to this film, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> but the message of the film is tremendous. There's no spoiler here. It's worth watching. The message is that you can live your life as a ghost, as Warren Beatty's character has done, Jay Billington Bulwer, for much of his life. But it's much better to be a spirit, not a ghost. Don't just be a ghost floating around, accepting the establishment uh, way of seeing things, accepting all of this fashionable rubbish just because it's a bit uncomfortable to be in the, the other group, the semi-cancelled group. And the message from that film is be a spirit, not a ghost. Uh, I've torn myself away from Legoland because I think there are a lot of spirits in this room and great friends as well, such as, as Neil and others, who've never followed the party line for the sake of expedience. So whoever, however you choose to stand and whoever you choose to stand for, my message, and I suppose my mission now, I didn't really mean to get this involved in politics again, but I have, is we need to take back control of our political system before it wrecks everything that we pay them to build. And in order for that to happen, we have to be the spirits to frighten the ghosts out of Parliament and actually put people of substance back in there. And it's just possible that many of the people driving that are in this room today. Thank you. Yeah. Do you want me to do any questions or do you want me to do any questions or not? Okay. What time? Thanks, Thanks very much.